<laughs> Thank you for coming. Welcome to the Island Lecture Series. Um, this is a program of the Institute of Island Studies, which we've been doing off and on, mostly on, since the late 1980s. So I've been around for a little while <laughs> doing these lectures. They used to be, um, we would organize a whole week of them in February, and or actually it was a whole month and then they'd be all over the island. So we'd have like a dozen, 10 to a dozen lectures on a theme, and we'd have all of these speakers. Mm -hmm. So now we've pared it down so we have, um, you know, maybe three from September to November, and then another three or four in January once a month. So a little bit more manageable. <laughs> um, but I still, folks coming out to a lecture on a Tuesday evening, it's pretty amazing. So thank you for being so before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is unceded Mi'kmaq territory. So Ebigwit, or Prince Edward Island, Mi'kmaq is covered by the historic treaties of peace and friendship. We pay our respects to the indigenous Mi'kmaq people who have occupied this island for over 12,000 years, past, present, and future. So I'm Dr. Lori Brinklow. I'm the chair of the Institute of Island Studies Executive, and I'm coordinator of the Master of Arts and Island Studies program. So the Institute, which is the hat I'm wearing tonight, is a research, education, and public policy institute. There's our little banner bug there. Um, it, uh, we are based just down the hall, so that's why I know where the washroom is. It's a classroom <laughs> on the left if you need it. Um, and you can learn more about what we do by checking out our website, which is just beautifully islandstudies.com. We got it very early on. Um, somebody else wanted it, but we said no, we have it. Um, or on our social media accounts. We also have the monthly newsletter, so I've sent around the sign-up sheet. And uh, so you'll, if you're on it, you'll find out about what's up next. So I am thrilled to be introducing Dr. Susan Graham this evening, who will share the results of her research on authentic Prince Edward Island tourism experiences. So she's a native of Summerside, born and bred. She's an associate professor of marketing with UPI's Faculty of Business, where she teaches introduction to marketing, integrated cases in marketing, brand management, and uh, the future of marketing. Usually all in one day. day. Yes, and today was one of those days, and here she is now, <laughs> talking in. Um, her research, and she started, what time, 6 o'clock this morning? I was on campus by 6.15 this yes, morning. Yes, okay. So, it's been a long day. It has. Her research program spans two distinct themes, uh, marketing islands as tourism destina destinations and the 2S LGBTQ plus inclusion in business management education. Dr. Graham is also a member of the Master of Arts and Island Studies Steering Committee and serves on May's Student Supervisory Committees. She lives in Charlottetown with her husband Brian and son Alex, and she's a passionate traveler, reader, hiker, chef, and Starbucks fan. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Susan. Thank, Thank you, you so much. very much, Lori. I should say my partner in time on the research with respect to 2SLGBTQ yes. people in the business education is my lovely colleague, Amy McFarland, Margaret's beautiful oh, daughter. So, okay. um, yes, we're going to keep this super casual. I'm going to share with you some research that I did a couple of years ago. Um, the reason I actually reached out to the Island Speakers series is because I actually attended Ed McDonald's uh, presentation about a year ago when he was uh, talking about um, the role of confederation and how, uh, I forget the exact, but the, how do you promote, how do we use tourism or incorporate confederation in tourism promotions when now there's a, you know, a, a less positive spin on uh, PEI's role in confederation uh, given sort of the, the, the pushback, the rightful pushback uh, in terms of the impact the Confederation had on our Indigenous communities. So he, he was here presenting and actually Jim Randall was in the audience and I forget the exact nature of his question but it was around authenticity in tourism and how you know our branding of PEI as the birthplace of the Confederation there's nuggets of authenticity and truth to that but there's also a lot of embellishment uh, in terms of uh, what our role in Confederation was, despite the fact that we brand ourselves that way from a marketing perspective. So Jim mentioned authenticity and I thought, I have some work in authenticity. Maybe that might be, this might be a good outlet uh, with which to share that uh, research. 
So that's my plan for today. I'm happy to stop at any point in time uh, to answer any questions or to have a bit of a discussion. Um, I'm going to quiz you along the way a little bit, nothing serious. Um, but yeah, please stop me at any point in time. If you have any questions, I'm happy to deviate from the plan, um, if you wish. All right, technology, do not fail me. It did, it did fail me. <laughs> it did fail me. Okay, here we go. Let's see. There we go. No. Why is it not advancing? Lori? It's advancing on my computer. It's not advancing on the screen. <coughs> Prince Edward Island. It's a 
think it's a UFO. I think it's the concession stand where you get your snacks. You had the talking uh, owl. You had wooden uh, swan boats that you could pedal around a ma man-made lake or pond or whatever you want to call it. From the outside looking in, there's nothing authentic about Rainbow Valley. And yet, if you talk to anybody from my generation, growing up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, who grew up here in Prince Edward Island, they would unequivocally say, this is an authentic Prince Edward Island experience. And I thought that contrast, that sort of juxtaposition against the outside looking in versus an insider's perspective was really interesting. So that's what inspired this particular work. I know I told Ed McDonald this. Uh, my friend and I went to see his exhibit last year at the Confederation Center that coincided with his uh, book, The Summer Trade. And I mean, the whole exhibit was fantastic. But we stood in front of the, quote, map of Rainbow Valley for a good 20 minutes talking about our favorite, you know, attractions and all oh, I remember going here when I was this age and it wasn't the end, you know, every end of year uh, school trip involved a visit to Rainbow Valley. So it very much has uh, significance to people who grew up here. And so I thought that was really interesting and that's what ultimately inspired this particular piece of research. So I wanted to know, is it possible to have an authentic tourism experience. A lot of the literature says no. The fact that you're a tourist, you're experiencing touristic experiences which are inherently staged, makes them by default inauthentic. Um, but I, I, wasn't, I wanted to look at this further and then if it was possible, I wasn't sure it was, if it was possible, what did those experiences look like from the perspectives of locals? That was basically the premise of this, of this research. So uh, around 20, when I started joining the university full time, uh, 2009, for about four or five years, and existed before I arrived, uh, the Faculty of Business here at UPEI was home to the Tourism Research Center, which was a, um, a, a distinct research body housed in the Faculty of Business, funded largely by ACOA, but also the provincial uh, government, particularly the Department of Tourism. And that research body, over the years, had uh, developed two research panels. One of visitors to PEI, they would ask people to subscribe uh, to the panel uh, when they visited PEI. And the, and the visitors uh, panel, at, last I heard, had 25,000 people on the panel that they would reach out to and do research. Um, they also had a second panel, and this panel was uh, of Prince Edward Islanders who were interested in tourism for whatever reason and who were willing to uh, participate in tourism research on occasion. That particular panel had about 600 people volunteered to be on the panel, and that is the panel that we used for this research. So we surveyed these 600 uh, islanders to, um, to ask them about authenticity in terms of PEI tourism experiences. So that's where uh, the data comes from. So yeah, there was over 600 members. We asked sort of two, we asked many questions, but two sort of broad thematic questions asking them if it was possible for visitors to experience authentic PEI, and if so, what would those experiences be or look like? We had a huge response rate. 400 people responded out of 600. That's a tremendous response rate for a, a survey. It was an online survey. And all the responses were open text. The people were typing in their answers. They weren't clicking boxes, you know, check this, check They were actually writing. Uh, what they felt were authentic experiences. And so I'm just going to share with you some of the findings. Uh, so the, yeah, the two main, first main question was, is it possible for visitors to experience authentic Prince Edward Island? And unequivocally, the answer was an enthusiastic yes. People who responded to the survey believed that visitors to Prince Edward Island had plenty of opportunities to experience the authentic PEI if they so chose to do so. So it was an overwhelming yes. 
they also expressed considerable confidence in their ability to discern what was an authentic experience versus what wasn't. They felt that they occupied a place of privilege, uh, they were intimately familiar with Prince Edward Island as their space, and felt very much that they had the authority to decide what was and what wasn't authentic. Uh, and, and as you'll see as we go through the results, uh, they really drew on their own lived experiences. Uh, in terms of deciding what was authentic and what wasn't. We did ask students, uh, or, or respondents, excuse me, I didn't put this in the slides, how many people, like how long have you lived in PEI? The overwhelming majority uh, lived here their ent entire life. Uh, those who didn't live here their entire life lived here at least 15 years. It was a very, very small number of people of the 400 who responded who lived in Prince Edward Island for less than five years. So the majority lived here for a considerable amount of time. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, okay. so in addition to asking them whether or not it was possible to experience authentic Prince Edward Island if you were a visitor, we asked them to pick three of this list of sort of broad touristic categories. What do we, uh, or the tourism department, promote as being tourism experiences in, in PEI? And we asked them to pick three of those and describe to us what exactly within that category would constitute an authentic experience. So, the, so we, they could choose beaches, coastal or water, culinary, cultural, uh, entertainment, golf, history, Lucy Vaughn Montgomery, nature or shopping. The numbers that are in the brackets beside those words are the number of people who chose to speak about that particular theme. So as you can see, beaches was very, very popular, um, culinary, entertainment, history and nature were all very popular. 13 people chose to talk about shopping. Uh, 69 people chose to talk about golf, but I'm going to be honest, they didn't talk about golf at all, they talked about the scenery. Everyone who was talking about golf was talking about the beautiful vistas at this particular hole, at this particular golf course. They wasn't talking about golf at all. Uh, but they chose golf, was the theme that they chose. Um, so those are the, the, sort of the broad themes. And I'm going to cover some of them uh, briefly, but if you want to go into further depth, I can provide you with more information. Let's see here. Um, so for those people who chose beach, beaches, was, which was one, coastal and waterways, which was another, or nature, which was another theme. These were sort of common themes that were, that were um, mentioned repeatedly. Everyone was talking about how pristine and untouched and unspoiled uh, PEI's natural environment, especially the beaches and um, the trails and all, all that was. They, that was overwhelmingly um, a common response, very natural, untouched, and preserved. Really, really were touting uh, the national and provincial parks, particularly the national parks, um, and how beautiful they were, and again, how pristine and well-preserved they were. They talked a lot about the trails, particularly the Confederation Trail, and how that was a really great way to experience authentic Prince Edward Island. It's interesting, it's a bit of a debate in case you didn't know, people are uh, debating whether or not we should allow ATVs on the Confederation Trail. Um, based on the findings from the survey, the answer would be unequivocally no. At no time did anybody talk about uh, ATVs and snowmobiles and how that was a great way to experience the island. But they did speak at great length about trails in general, but specifically the Confederation Trail. They talked about uh, these natural environments as being hidden gems, but that were readily accessible. They talked a lot about quiet solitude, you know, going to the beach and, you know, just going a little ways down from the, from the boardwalk if you're at Brackley and you have the beach to yourself and it's quiet and you can enjoy that quiet headspace, get away, unplug, uh, that the trails were the same, that it was quiet, very peaceful, um, really a way to decompress and to get away from the noise of the real world. They talked excessively about active transportation. Walking, hiking, biking, canoeing, kayaking, swimming, sailing, at no time did they mention, again, ATVs, snowmobiles, 
uh, jet skis, motorboats, it was all uh, active transportation. They really recommended that as a fantastic way to experience the beauty that Prince Edward Island had to offer. And they spoke eloquently about the natural flora and fauna that you would find along the way. So very, very um, enthusiastic response uh, to sort of the more natural uh, environment. Culinary was a very popular uh, topic, no surprise. A lot of emphasis on any food that was either grown, harvested, produced in Prince Edward Island. And they would name specific food. Lots of lobster, potato, mussels, oysters, blueberries, you name it. They were, you know, you read this section of the survey, you get hungry after a while. Because mm -hmm. they talked about all the amazing food that we uh, cultivate here in PEI. But they also made some interesting distinctions. They also talked about food experiences. And for somebody who's not from Prince Edward Island, if you were to read the findings uh, of the survey, you would see people talk about lobster, and you'd see people talk about lobster suppers. And if you're an islander, you know those are not the same things, right? A lobster supper is a very specific thing. And it was very clear that they were talking about that unique experience going to a church basement or a community hall uh, and having, you know, a lobster, a plastic bib put on you and there was potato salad and homemade rolls and lemon meringue pie. It was a very, very specific experience that they distinguished very clearly from just eating lobster. And so both of those things were represented uh, quite, uh, you know, quite a lot in the data and very clearly distinctive. Local, local, local was the most common word in the whole uh, survey. If you forget, I counted. It was like hundreds of times this word was used. So locally produced, locally sourced, uh, local restaurants, local chefs, local, 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 local. They named restaurants. They named a lot of restaurants. <coughs> Anybody want, there was one restaurant that was named way more frequently than any other restaurant. One stood out leaps and bounds above any other restaurant. Anyone want to guess what it was? Point Prince? Island Reserves? No, no. Point Water Prince? No. No. Those were mentioned, but that... Point Prince? No. Man, the Fisherman's Wharf? You're getting closer. What? Lobster on the Wharf? No. Prince Street? New Glasgow Lobster Suppers, by oh, yeah. a country mile, yeah. was yeah. named by name more than any other restaurant. The other ones you were naming were named. There, there was a lot of what restaurants are, are considered authentic, but leaps and bounds ahead of anybody else was New Glasgow Lobster Suppers. I had never been uh, until I read this and was like, well, literally, I need to go to New Glasgow Lobster Suppers, which I did, and it was fantastic. Um, interestingly, yeah, these other restaurants were named. There were several um, respondents who distinguished and didn't, uh, in, in not a positive way, the Murphy group of restaurants, and said that was, they're too big now, they don't consider them local. Um, Certainly, they were adamant, no chain restaurants, no, you know, McDonald's and Boston Pizza. That was a no-go. Uh, but there were some that actually said no-go to the Murphy Group of restaurants as well. They were really focused on other restaurants. But New Glasgow, head and shoulders, uh, named more than anybody else. Um, they spoke a lot about farmers and fishers and how important uh, those individuals and those industries were to Prince Edward Island. They talked about things like buying fresh vegetables at the end of a farmer's uh, lane along the highway. They talked about going um, down to the wharf when fishers were coming in with their daily catch and buying directly from them. There was a lot of those uh, responses and yeah, the importance of the two, of the two industries was, was very important. History. This, this survey was done, I should have checked this, around 2013. So our 
more sensitive awareness around uh, the implications of branding ourselves as the birthplace of the Confederation, that really wasn't as prominent a conversation at the time. So identifying ourselves as the birthplace of the Confederation was a very common theme um, in throughout uh, the various different topics, but certainly within the topic of history, that came through over and over again. Everything from talking about Province House, PEI's role in Confederation, the Fathers of Confederation, which is what the, you know, the people dressed up in the period costumes were called at the time. They're now, there's a different name for them now, but uh, that's what they were called at the time. Uh, so people were like really very proud of PEI's role in Confederation, or at least the way it's portrayed. And um, that came through uh, very clear. A lot of uh, recognition of the founding cultures of PEI, which according to the respondents included indigenous communities, um, British but really Scottish and Irish, and French or Acadian uh, cultures. They talked a lot about that uh, as being a really uh, authentic uh, opportunity to experience Prince Edward Island. They really emphasized that you needed to get out of Charlottetown and certainly out of Cavendish if you wanted to experience the real PEI. Um, Charlottetown was viewed very positively. Cavendish, not so much. There were specific things within Cavendish that, that uh, the respondents felt were authentic. For example, the national parks and the Green Gables House, even though it's not <laughs> authentic, uh, that was viewed as authentic. But really, the rest of Cavendish was not identified at all, and in fact, in some cases, was identified as not being authentic. Um, and they really, respondents really encouraged people to get out of Charlottetown. Yes, come experience Charlottetown. There was lots to experience here that they considered to be authentic. But if you really wanted to experience authentic PEI, you had to go further afield. And they named all kinds of little communities across the island, really from tip to tip. They talked a lot, again, about uh, the, our history in relation to agriculture and fishing and talked about various museums located across the province, whether it's the Potato Museum in O'Leary, uh, uh, the museum in Basin Head. They, they were identifying museums uh, where people could learn more about these um, important industries. Orwell Corner was mentioned a whole bunch of times um, in terms of an authentic experience. They talked a lot about the importance of preservation. Not only were people identifying specific experiences that they felt were authentic, they really were speaking about how important it was to protect, preserve, honor, respect uh, these um, experiences because there was a risk of them, these experiences not existing if we didn't take care of them. Uh, actually, uh, Lori just recently uh, went to Aruba to a conference there and I had a student who went with her uh, present a piece of work stemming from this research that looked at all the different themes associated with sustainability that sort of came through uh, in the responses. It, the, this research was not about sustainability at all, but certainly when you read through the responses, there was an undercurrent in people's um, minds about how important it was that they felt that there was lots of authentic experiences available for people to come and experience in Prince Edward Island, but they also cautioned that these things were fragile. And people were welcome, very welcomed, to come and experience these, experience these things, but people were invited to help us take care of those experiences as well. So, and a lot of pride. Really, the pride was all over the place. Uh, in in uh, in the uh, in the findings, culture, entertainment, and Lucy Maud Montgomery, music, Kaylee's. I had to learn how to type the word Kaylee because <laughs> who knows how to spell that word. Um, that came through over and over and over again. Kitchen parties. Overwhelmingly, people were talking about the talent that was embedded in this province. That whether it's musicians or artists of, of a variety of different kinds, people were really, really boastful of the rich talent that was um, rooted here in Prince Edward Island. Of course, all things Anne, the musical, um, Anne of Green Gables House, uh, anything associated with Lucy Maud Montgomery, that was mentioned over and over and over again. 
Again, heritage tied to the founding cultures was really important. You know, people uh, talked about you know visiting the Evangeline region or the Rustico region to experience uh, Acadian culture. They talked about the various festivals that celebrate various um, cultural roots in, in the province. Um, and again, heritage tied to agriculture and fisheries was uh, repeatedly uh, touted uh, throughout the responses. So very briefly, some of the theoretical stuff. Uh, if you look at the authenticity research, authenticity really covers three broad types of authenticity. Objective authenticity, constructive authenticity, and existential authenticity. Objective authenticity means this object is what we say it is. So the tractor that's on display at Orwell uh, Corner, when they say it's from the you know late 19, or 1800s or 1900s, early 1900s, somebody with knowledge has bestowed on this particular object the quality of authenticity, right? So the, you know, letters handwritten by Lucy Maud Montgomery, or a piece of art that we know was produced by a particular artist. The object themselves are bestowed with the quality of authenticity. And there was lots of examples. They did, they talked, uh, the respondents talked a lot about the various museums across the island. There was a number of people who uh, expressed their frustration and the need for a provincial museum. Um, in the literature or in, the, in their responses. So object, objective authenticity was well represented in the responses. Constructive authenticity means we apply our own perspectives and meaning to experiences and it's that process that bestows authenticity or denotes or embeds authenticity into that experience. That, this was probably by far the most common type of authenticity because people were talking about their own experiences. Well, I am an islander. I do this. Therefore, the fact that I do it makes it an authentic experience. So if you as a visitor come and do what I do, you are experiencing the authentic Prince Edward Island. That came through over and over again. People were talking about, this is the beach that I always went to growing up. If I went there growing up, it's clearly an authentic experience, it's sort of the Rainbow Valley effect, right? On the, on the outskirts or from the outside, there's nothing about Rainbow Valley that looks like it would be authentic, except that islanders of my generation would unequivocally agree it's an authentic experience. So that's constructive authenticity. And then existential authenticity, there was a number of people who spoke about the opportunities when visiting Prince Edward Island to be your authentic self, to shut off the busy world of work and other responsibilities, to come to PEI, find a quiet place on the beach, read a book, go for a walk, be with yourself, and be your authentic self. And they really felt that there were all kinds of opportunities, particularly those tied to um, nature and, and beaches and the water, where you could really tune into, hone into who you are and be your authentic self while visiting Prince Edward Island. So the authentic, authenticity wasn't about other things being authentic, it was about you being authentic when you are here. And that actually came through surprisingly more than I was expecting. So that's enough of the theory. Uh, some, some themes really emerged. Everyone who responded felt very confident that they had the authority that they could decide. They had the power, the privilege to decide what was authentic. We are islanders after all. Who would know better than we would know what is an authentic uh, PEI experience? A lot of the things that people talked about were very nostalgic. Things that they did growing up, things that their family did, something that was connected to their upbringing, that really came through. So again, the Rainbow Valley uh, experience. It's authentic because everyone of my generation did that when they were a child. It was a shared experience. So nostalgia came through uh, in, with flying colors for people who grew up here. What they did growing up, where they went growing up, those were authentic experiences that their authenticity was deeply rooted. P 
people were very, very uh, deeply connected to their place and to the people in those places. So people were talking about, it's not only about going to local restaurants like to do classical lobster suppers, it was talking to the wait staff there because they likely lived in the neighborhood and their grandparents probably lived in the neighborhood. And so they, they were making those kinds of connections that these places are incredibly rooted in our communities. Tremendous pride. That just came through over and over and over again. People were very, very proud of Prince Edward Island, their connection to Prince Edward Island, and they were very, very willing to share. Come and experience our island. You are really welcomed to experience our, our place. The word our came up a lot. Our national parks, our beaches, as if we owned them. Uh, so there was a real sense of ownership, even when you didn't physically own uh, the asset, um, but a, a really strong willingness to share. However, people were invited to share and to, to share in our experiences, but with the, with the caveat, we want you to take care of our place, right? Come and enjoy the, the nature trails, but don't touch anything. Like, don't, you know, the only thing you leave behind are footprints. They were, they were very, very clear. <laughs> That, um, that there was lots of opportunity to experience authentic PEI, but it was fragile. And we, you were invited to come, but please respect that fragility and help us protect and preserve authentic PEI. Uh, and they did, even though we didn't ask them what was inauthentic, Islanders were happy to share what they thought was inauthentic. <laughs> so uh, they talked about... Uh, you know, certainly like chain restaurants, um, and even again, the Murphy restaurants, they did not. There was a few people that mentioned Gahan and a few of the, but in general, no, you want small, you know, locally owned um, uh, restaurants. Very, very uh, skeptical of a lot of souvenirs. Uh, they, they use, you know, plastic, uh, made in China, uh, were very critical of that. They did highlight sort of arts and crafts and that that was a great opportunity to purchase authentic PEI goods or and food, you know, purchase PEI produced food. But they were very like, you know, the typical souvenirs. I mean, all you have to do is go and flip them upside down and you see the little sticker that says made in China. And they were very opposed to that. Um, some other inauthentic experiences. They were a little bit leery of, um, experiences that were heavily touted as tourism experiences. Again, they, they didn't, they weren't saying anything bad about Cavendish, but they were not encouraging people to go to the Cavendish boardwalk, for example, or, um, you know, even Shining Waters. Even though it's this, basically the same thing as Rainbow Valley, it didn't have the roots in the same way. So they were, uh, they liked to point out what was inauthentic as well. Um, what this, as I'm wrapping up, the conclusions, locals do have a really unique perspective to offer. One that's really not covered, surprisingly, in the, schol in the scholarly literature. They don't really ask uh, locals what they think. It's, it's a very, authenticity is a, can be a very elitist concept. Certain people have the authority to bestow or to, to, you know, determine this is authentic. And it's very elitist, it's very um, exclusionary, uh, colonial, uh, but they, they felt this was a very democratic process, that they actually felt they had the authority to decide what was authentic and, or not, and they felt their um, viewpoints carried a considerable amount of weight. Um, they were. I mean, so many experiences. I tried to summarize some of the highlights, but they, there really were a wide variety of experiences that people were sharing. A lot of them tied to their own lived experiences. You know, if you grew up, as I did in Summerside, going to Thunder Cove was sort of the beach we went to when I was growing up. That's what I consider an authentic beach. So very much tied to what they grew up doing, where they grew up, where their family's cottage was, all those sorts of things. Um, so authenticity was very rooted in their personal lived experiences. Um, we just we talked about the three different themes uh, of authenticity. 
And they did sort of, and sort of, they, respondents addressed the fact that they weren't convinced that the tourism marketing that's undertaken primarily by the Department of Tourism really captured the authentic Prince Edward Island as well as they would like it to capture it. Uh, that the focus was on packaged, um, uh, sanitized, uh, a word that, that respondents use plastic, and I don't think they meant like physically plastic, but just sort of this manufactured authenticity, uh, which they didn't necessarily think gelled with their own experiences. Responses that, that people gave, yeah. and obviously there were there were responses based on their own experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Were there any experiences or any thoughts or shared about their parents or grandparents' experiences in terms of what does it uh, often? Um, in the sense that they were really talking about their experiences growing up and being deeply rooted. I mean, they talked about things like you know your waiter at New Glasgow Lobster Suppers, their grandparents probably lived out there. They, they were making those kinds of references. A lot of experiences about them growing up and their family experiences at a certain beach or uh, you know, camping or uh, having clam bakes or those sorts of things. But not necessarily about specifically their parents, like, you know, my parents grew up here. No. No, it was more from their own perspective, mm -hmm. and so, you know, obviously that would be shaped by their parents and grandparents, but, right. yeah. Susan, what was the age span sort of thing? That yeah, so it skewed a little bit older than the average age was in early 50s. Skewed heavily, uh, heav he heavily, I've been at the English yeah. since quarter after six. <laughs> heavily female and higher educated. Oh, you know, the average education level was like university degree and higher. So not the average islander, um, keeping in mind as well. So how this panel was populated, the Tourism Research Center, you know, put ads in the newspaper and the buzz and put out a variety of invitations for any islander who was interested in tourism. If you wanted to participate in a local uh, tourism research panel, you could sign up. So it's going to naturally heavily skew to people who are interested in tourism, maybe working in tourism or having a small business related to tourism. So it, this isn't the average islander uh, at all. Um, it was, you know, skewed in certain ways. But having read the responses, it it, it really felt like this. It was islanders speaking. Yeah. 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 Um, the tourism marketing message I find is getting. It's it's. Almost irrelevant now. It is so packaged. Yeah. Why are they not consulting with locals? Because mm -hmm. I just feel there's an incredible disconnect, and they could really turn it around by talking to locals and extracting something from that. The marketer in me would answer the question this way: because Tai Pai and the Department of Tourism doesn't serve islanders; it serves the tourism industry. True. Right. But that would be the marketer in me saying, okay. you know, who, 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 who does Thai Pai serve? Mm -hmm. It doesn't serve islanders, it serves the tourism industry. So those viewpoints are overrepresented um, in the work that they produce. That would be my speculation. But they don't really talk to tourism operators either. Probably not the grassroots ones. They talk about the you know the larger ones, that the the the, 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 the yeah. yeah the Matt Jellies of the world. Exactly. Uh, they talk to them, but I I agree with you. The the very small tourists I, they probably don't. No, I am one. Yes, I'm not surprised <laughs> at all. That's, I uh, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. 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 But shouldn't it be more of a by us and with us kind of approach? Should it be? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're not. You're not. I'm not argue with you at all. I think that, and I think we're starting to see a little bit of pushback from Islanders uh, in regards to prioritizing tourism over 
Islanders. Actually, I was having a bit of a Twitter conversation today. Um, well, oh, it was, it was, I responded to McQueen's bike shop was saying, you know, keep the Confederation Trail ATV free, which I absolutely do, do not put ATVs on the Confederation Trail. It is an absolute, in my personal view, a gem. I use it all the time. Um, I think it is a tremendous asset for Prince Edward Islanders. The argument that some of the people who are advocating for ATVs to be on the Confederation Trail is that it would boost tourism for people who want to drive their ATVs on the trail. My response on Twitter was the economic, not that I think tourism should be the driving um, this, uh, influence on this decision. I think it should be about what's best for islanders, not what's best for tourists. But even if we were to say tourism was a major factor in considering whether or not to put ATVs on the Confederation Trail, I would argue, without any data to support it, except for my experience in doing this kind of research, is that the economic impact of active transportation on the Confederation Trail, people who come to walk the island trail, to walk the Confederation Trail, to bike, to hike, to far outweighs any economic impact of ATVs coming to Prince Edward Island by, by, a, by a mile. So if we have to make a tourism argument, which I don't think we should have to, but we often do, I think that makes no sense. People are quite literally coming to Prince Edward Island to walk the island trail, to, to, to walk the Confederation Trail, to do the tip to tip, to bike it, to, uh, you know, and that those economic impacts, if that's important, far outweigh the ATV benefits. I mean, I really, really, really hope they don't. I, I, mean, I would go as far as to say, get the snowmobiles off as well. Mm -hmm. People would love yes. to snowshoe and yes. cross country <laughs> ski. And I have walked on the trail in the winter. I know I'm not supposed to. It's very close to my house. And I will say the snowmobilers have been great. They see me, they very clearly slow down. But it's so noisy. It's so... The beauty of the trail is the quiet. For me, that's the beauty of the trail. It's the quiet. And they just it's just destroyed. And if we really want to expand our, like, the seasonal expansion plan that's happening right now, we really want people doing things year-round. Yes! We're taking those trails away in the winter. From Absolutely. Because those um, are the safest ones to be walking all winter. Yes. Like Bontras, stuff like that. It gets icy. It's, it's hard, yes. for certain people to do it. But. Yeah. Taking yes. spot all yeah, I think the argument for tourism to allow motorized vehicles actually is bad for tourism. I think if you really wanted to grow tourism in the off season or the shoulder season, having those trails be free of ATVs or snowmobiles is absolutely a wonderful marketing strategy. Yeah. Again, I don't think we should have to justify it from a tourism lens. I think the fact that islanders use these trails and are enjoying our island, I don't think we need to justify using tourism <laughs> uh, logic, but if we have to, if that's the language we have to speak, I think you could make a very compelling argument. I think the evidence would overwhelmingly support the idea that keeping them off the trail is actually better for tourism. Yeah. So in terms of the, the ATVs being um, taught, taught, taught it as, as boosting tourism, so how many tourists are coming over with their ATVs or are they renting or, or using the ATVs here? I don't know that there's a ton of data on that. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I suspect it's people bringing their own ATVs over uh, and, you know, exploring so, the island on their ATVs. So, so in that respect, how many of those tourists that, that come over are lugging their ATVs on the trailer to come over compared to just regular tourists yeah. that, are, that would like to experience. Yeah. yeah. So there's environmental implications of lugging, you know, a trailer with ATVs on it. I would also argue, and I, I don't like referring to tourists this way, but high value tourists, tourists that spend a good amount of money, you know, spend good money on accommodations, good money on food, you know, spend money on good shopping that really benefits the local community are the exact same kind of tourists that want to hike the trails, that want to, uh, you know, do the island nature trail. Um, I just was telling, I just got back from the Camino Trail. Uh, I turned 50 in October and I took myself to Spain to hike the Camino Trail. 
And like, I came home thinking, why don't we see, like, so part of the Camino experience is getting stamps along the way at every little bar and restaurant and cafe. And there's hundreds of thousands of people walking this trail. Never really felt crowded except for the Sunday we were getting close to uh, Santiago. It was getting a little bit crowded, but this idea of stamps. What a neat way to encourage people who are using the trail system to pop into local shops and restaurants and cafes and bakeries because those stamps are coveted. Everybody wants to get those stamps. So those kinds of tourists, they spend money. They're quality tourists. I hate referring to people that way. It's judgmental and, and I would go so far as to say even elitist. But those are really good tourists to have. They spend money locally, they support local, uh, and they're not causing disproportional damage to the island when they're here. They're trying to enjoy it in its natural state. And those are really, really valuable tourists. They spend a lot of money and they're a growing segment of the tourist uh, industry. And one I think we could do a really good job of attracting, especially in the shoulder seasons when we want to bring more people uh, to PEI, that's what's going to bring them. It's not going to be snow, uh, snowmobiles and ATVs. So, yeah. Is there a separate body that looks at the data not from a slick marketing standpoint? My background in marketing is just from the specific piece. Um, to advise the tourism advisory board or whatever, or the... Uh, I mean, the research body would be Tai Pai, has a research arm to it. What does Tai Pai stand for? The uh, Tourism Industry Association of Prince Edward Island. Okay. But it represents the industry. Okay. They do, uh, they do research, they collect data, they, you know, they have very good research capabilities. But the, you know, the, the research questions they're pursuing are ultimately to inform the industry right. and to help Tai Pai represent the needs of the industry and lobby to a certain extent with the provincial government. So, n no, the, the, the tourism research center that was here, I really don't want to get into too much detail because it ended scandalously, but, um, uh, you know, it would have been a little bit more arm's length. I say that the primary funders were ACOA and the provincial department of tourism. So how arm's length are you when all of your money is coming from, you know, those, those bodies? But no, there really isn't um, sort of a looking at tourism from the perspective of islanders. No, to my knowledge, there's not uh, a body that does that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it kind of popped into my mind when you were talking about Rainbow Valley, but um, I didn't grow up on PEI, but my father's family is from here and we spent our summers here yep. um, on my grandfather's farm. And so we, we, we had a big family and, and we ended up with becoming friends with a lot of the farm kids and yep. stuff and there was always somebody your age. Yep. But one thing that, that most of them did all summer long was to save money and collect bottles and stuff like that. Whatever they could, uh, whatever way they could make some extra money to go to the exhibition. Yes. Yeah, that came, that was one. Festivals uh, were, Indian River Festival, which is, I don't think it's called that anymore. Um, uh, Old Home Week, uh, Time Valley Oyster Festival. Like the, yeah. the, 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 there's a shopping list of every major festival that was mentioned over and over and over again uh, as an authentic. PEI experience and really, um, you know, the respondents were encouraging people to go outside of Charlottetown. They certainly mentioned Old Home Week a lot, but they also mentioned all kinds of uh, Rollo Bay Fiddle Festival. Um, Lobster Carnival? Yes, all of them. Every festival that <laughs> was, was named by name as a, as a way to get outside of Charlottetown, get outside of Cavendish and really see the authentic Prince Edward Island. But really, when I'm thinking of though is that for every kid that did that that was totally authentic yes. there's nothing except for the the, the the farming and the 4-H kind of element to it if you looked at the uh, amusement park there's nothing <laughs> PEI about amusement parks there's amusement no. parks all over the world but these kids saving money all yeah. we, we never did because I we never went into Charlottetown in yeah. the summers 
But for them to do that, that experience is a real authentic experience for them. Yeah. But it doesn't translate to, to off-island people. I mean, people do come over and bring their kids to go to the exhibition and stuff like yeah. that. But, it's, but that's kind of a, a, not an authentic PEI thing for outsiders to come to. In the sense of it doesn't represent PEI or right. doesn't have, you know, the Yeah, home. people who come to Prince Edward Island during Old Home Week who live elsewhere often have roots in Prince yeah. Edward Island. Yeah. The Old Home Week means so something to the them. Experience. So yeah. it's a real subjective Yeah, thing. absolutely. That came through very clearly. Yeah. Um, authenticity is individually defined and experienced. And that came through over and over and over again. It was whatever you did growing up that you felt really captured that period of your life, that was what was authentic yeah. uh, to you. And a lot of those things have changed. I remember having this conversation with my parents this summer because Summerside Lobster Carnival isn't what it used to be. I remember growing up <laughs> in Summerside and you know, my parents would say, well, we're going to the Lobster Carnival on Tuesday night. And that whole day was nothing but like, I cannot wait to go to the, the you know, and ride the rides and, and like that just doesn't happen. Even my own son, who's 20, I think he's, I took him to the exhibition here in Charlottetown once or twice, but it wasn't something that I was, a lot of his friends were doing, like we weren't doing that, yeah. uh, you know, as a, as a group of friends or whatever, it really wasn't happening in the same way. So you're absolutely right. It isn't, it's, it's based on your own lived experiences and that came through over and over. I did this growing up, therefore that's an authentic experience. And so if somebody from away comes to visit PEI and does this experience, they will catch a glimpse of what my life was like. And yeah, so um, yeah, absolutely was individually defined for sure. Yeah. Has this survey been done with the other group of, of um, just tourists? No. The and what would they? Interesting. Uh, right after this was done, the Tourism Research Center went yeah. for reasons we will not get into. Uh, but so no, but it would have been a very interesting uh, comparison. Yes. Like, what do visitors say yes. are authentic yes. experiences, and how much of their view is shaped by the marketing that yes. is produced? Right, because that, when you travel somewhere, you rely on those destinations to tell you what is authentic. And if you're a seasoned traveler and you're, you're looking for authenticity, you kind of know, like, take it with a grain of salt. But now I mean, we have access to information today that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago when you were really relying on those tourism visitors guides mm -hmm. to be sort of your source of information about what to do when you were visiting Prince Edward Island. So um, I mean, it would have been interesting, but no. anymore. What was that? How are you going to have those guides anymore? No, I mean, because people don't use them. Right? They're moving it all. It's expensive online. and you can have it online and it can be much more interactive and yeah. engaging and uh, yeah, so we're moving away from that printed material, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. We're moving so much to, to big groups of um, different, like all the cruise ships. Yes. And, and between those groups and then the music festival yes. groups. I mean, you compare the numbers that come either to either of those two in comparison mm -hmm. to all the other tourists that come here in the summer. You get would get very skewed results, I'm sure. Yes. But, you know, I mean, I've heard over the last number of years the um, advertising that Newfoundland does for their tourism. People comment on it over and over again, including myself. How brilliant it is! How enticing it is! Yeah. And it's not. And their tourism isn't about these big things. It's right. about um, experience. Yes. Newfoundland with us, which is what these. This is showing. Yes. But to me, we're moving further and further away from that and PEI. Yeah. Maybe, is it all driven by the money? Um, I mean, there's real questions about, yeah. depending on the, the kind of tourism business you operate, but if you're a hotel operator or even a restaurant operator, cruise ships don't really benefit you all that much. No. Right? If you're maybe a small craft store or souvenir shop in downtown Charlottetown, you might benefit. But... Um, the impact of cruise ships uh, is, is not quite as a lot, you know, yeah, there's a lot of people here, but they're here for the day. They've already eaten before they get off the ship. They're going to eat supper on the ship. Um, they might do a little bit of shopping, but 
that's the extent of what they're going to be spending and leaving locally. The only impact really is, that, is their numbers. Yeah, and like you know, they, like, so, you know, a few thousand, you know, yeah, so five thousand people come to PEI for the day. Yeah, and they, and they might go on a tour. They might yeah. take a tour bus out to, uh, and, you know, and yeah, exactly. house. So, so that might, you know, there, um, there is benefit. I'm not suggesting there's no benefit, but it's not the same as somebody who comes and spends a weekend or a long weekend or a week here. It's not the same at all. I also will speak to Cavendish Beach Music Festival because there was a real divide in the findings of the, of the survey. Some people were championing the CBMF concerts as a great chance to see, because they do feature some local artists on a way backstage, back in the field, during, you know, like noon hour. <laughs> not during prime time. Uh, some people did say it was an authentic tourism experience. Others said, not at all. It's, it, there's nothing authentic about it. It's, um, you know, profit-driven um, experience that has nothing to do with Prince Edward Island. So there was a, that was really a mixed bag, that one. And, uh, yeah, there wasn't a consensus on that, unlike other areas where, like, it was a clear consensus this was an authentic experience. I'd yeah. be curious to hear their thoughts now more recently with the two weekend festivals in yes. a row. Because that's yes. such an uproar too, right? Like if this data is from a little bit ago. Yes. And there's, I mean, I mean, you know this, there's issues. Like we're already busy in July and August. We don't need to bring more people here during, it's, it's, you know, I have a, co a colleague who's on the board of a national tourism research body and they're having their conference in Prince Edward Island. They want to have the conference in July or August. Well, of course you do. Who, of course you want to come to PEI. And, and uh, conventions was like, not a chance are we giving up hundreds of hotel rooms and for a conference. We're already packed. Come in October or in, you know, late May or, um, so, yeah, so these concerts, yeah, they bring a lot of people, they spend money in certain ways in certain locations, but we're already really busy during that time period. Uh, so is there, is there really a net benefit? There's a net benefit to the Murphy family, absolutely. And to certain restaurants and campgrounds and cottages and what all, you know, they benefit for sure. But we're gonna be busy anyway. Charlottetown restaurants are going to be busy every weekend in the summer, regardless. So whether the SOMO Festival or CBMF is going on, um, it, it doesn't, they're going to be busy anyway. So, yeah, so, that, you know, some people really benefit from it, but I'm not sure the tourism. Some people really suffer from it. So absolutely, yes, yeah, yeah fair enough, yeah. Um, did you get uh, any sense from the questionnaire how many, <clears throat> how many people are, actually interested in having an authentic experience. Was there any sort of sense, well, I, I, you know, I don't care if it's real PEI or, or if it's not, you know, if it originated here. I just want to get away from where I am. And just want to have a good experience. I, just, yeah. Yeah, because we were asking locals that we didn't know, we did not get to that. But in other scholarly literature, there does seem to be, uh, growth in what's called slow tourism, where people really get to know a place and slow down. And, um, you know, I use the example, when I finished my doctorate degree, I went and spent six weeks in Paris. That was what I committed to myself when I finished uh, that. So I took my kid out of grade one, and we went yeah. and we lived in Paris for six weeks. And the reason was because I didn't want, I wanted to go to Paris, but I didn't want to go for a week, stay in a hotel and run around like a mad person trying to see everything. I wanted to go and have a cafe where after a few days they recognized me and knew what my order was. I wanted to go to a bakery and, you know, become a regular there. I, right, so so that there is a growth in slow travel. There is a growth in people who are looking for more authentic experience. That, that's, that's where Airbnb, that's sort of the origins of that. I'm not necessarily saying, that, I think they moved beyond what they were originally intending to be. But, you know, one of the reasons why many people, early on in particular, were choosing sort of the Airbnb model was they wanted to be in more, uh, to live in a place so that they could sort of feel a little bit more connected to the place. 
you know, it was also to save money and you could cook your own meals and if you have a large family there was, you know, it was easier to find accommodation. But there, part of the reason was to kind of live like a local for a very short period of time. So I do think there's an interest in some tourists, some visitors, they do want to experience local. They want to know where locals go to eat. They don't want to know where the visitor's guide tells you to go, or even where the concierge at the hotel tells you to go, because, you know, they could be getting slipped to 20 to, you know, they want to know, where do you go? You're from Charlottetown. Where do you recommend I go to eat? That's what they're looking for. And there is a significant number of tourists, I think, who are looking for that. I don't think all of them. I think there's some that are quite happy to go and have the Disney experience, even though, you know, the packaged, uh, uh, plastic, preordained experience. There's some people who want that, but there are some people who are looking for something different and looking to experience. Did you see many ATVs on the Camino Trail? Zero. <laughs> Even the, the people who were cycling were not well received some days okay. because they were very aggressive. There was one day where everyone was complaining about the cyclists. Uh, it was quite hilly, so they were coming up on us really fast, and they don't tell you until they're on you. And um, no, there's no ATVs on, on the Camino Trail. Lots of people walking all in the same direction. Any last comments or questions for, for Susan? This is a lovely group. This is. You, this is what a wonderful evening. Yes. It's such a great, uh, well, it's one of my favorite topics, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's an interesting topic for sure. Actually, last, uh, out of all that, like, people's um, experiences say this is authentic to, uh, was there any kind of, uh, maybe biased or maybe, I don't know, mm -hmm. but to, 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 come out of that with a summary of here are all the authentic kind of places around the around the island. Is there something that as a as a as a recent newcomer or or somebody that wants to you know experience that lead slow yeah. where would they go to kind of get that information? I think they'd go and talk to an islander and not go to the tourism visitor's guide, whether it's online or in print version. I think you talk to your waiter at the restaurant. You talk to, uh, the, you know, the person who's behind the counter at the, sh at the coffee shop you're going to and ask them for the recommendations. I don't think it's as easy as putting together, here's the list of what's authentic, because there was so much covered that it would be, you know, I, I think it would be inauthentic for me to try to, you know, boil it down to a neat little top ten things to do in, in PEI. I think that would be the antithesis of what was actually being said here. I think it was that there's just such a variety of things that are authentic. And so if you want to get, to figure out what that is, talk to people. Uh, talk, and they, they talked about that, you know, talk to the, your waiter, talk to the person working at the hotel, talk to, and find out, you know, what beach you should go to, or, um, yeah, I mean, I do it, if I run into, uh, you know, a visitor and strike up a conversation, I'll tell them, you know, head out to Richards at Cove Head, or go here, or go there, and offer them my recommendations, and Islanders, you know, especially in this survey, but I think Islanders in general are very happy to share with you their, <laughs> their opinion on what would be a great, uh, you know, what should I do today? Well, just ask an Islander. They will tell you. And yeah, it but that's, be, you, that's also yeah. why you're going to get 20 different answers from 20 Yeah, answers. absolutely. Absolutely. You, you will get 20 different answers. And I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think yeah. it's reflective of the fact that there's all kinds of authenticity in PEI that's just ripe for the picking if you just go and look for it. Um, yeah. Didn't they at one point make buttons that said Ask an Islander? Yeah, there was a, there was a, a website as well, Ask an Islander. Yeah. 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 Did you have one more? Yeah, I just had to ask for my own. I, I own a deep sea fishing business. Yeah. Oh, that was came through. Came oh my gosh, <laughs> yes. I mean, I could have gotten, yeah. but that was a very, very, very <laughs> common uh, response. That, yeah. digging for clams was a big one. Um, 
uh, cooking your own lobster. So yes, there was going to uh, lobster suppers, uh, but cooking your own lobster uh, as an experience uh, was big. But yeah, deep sea fishing was mentioned repeatedly uh, as a great, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you are well covered. There you go. Well, again, thank you so much. I You're just, very welcome. It was really fun. Um, as a gift, um, this is uh, Josh McFadden's oh, book, Time Flies. Fabulous. Um, and speaking of which, um, he will be doing the next lecture in January. But before that, we're going to actually celebrate with goodies and I think some bubbly or something here um, uh, next Wednesday. So for the book launch, please come back if you want, 7.30, November 29th, 7.30 here in the faculty lounge. And then in January, we'll have his actual lecture. We'll, he, he'll talk about the background to the book. The book is, is fascinating. It is Prince Edward Island from the air, a history of, and it shows the before and after photographs. So. Is the next week event in the newsletter from this month? Uh, yes. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Yes, okay. it is. The newsletter. Yes. Yes, the newsletter. If you have not subscribed, the newsletter is fantastic. I literally read it from top to bottom. Yeah. And I always love to give the potato bag <laughs> yes. because this is such another wonderful, authentic. Yes. It doesn't have potatoes in it, but it's got PEI books in it. So that's yeah. pretty authentic, okay. too. Thank you very much. Those very bags are made in PEI. They <laughs> are. And your daughter would know. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks everyone, for coming. Thank you very much. It's a lovely way to spend the evening. But I am tired. <laughs> okay, go <laughs> home. Oh. Technology works.